Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Miles Wool, and I'm a freelance artist and illustrator. And yep, I'm also a grown man who still likes to play with toys. Confessions aside, if you clicked on this video, it's probably because you want to see the four steps I used to create this Batman oil painting. Or maybe you want to hear about the 30 year old inspiration for this piece. I promise, we'll get to that. But before we do, I want to talk about what made me decide to create this video, and hopefully many more upcoming videos on this channel. It may surprise you to learn that although I spent most of my teens with a pencil in my hand, I actually spent the next 25 years of my life in software. First as a software engineer, and then moving up through increasing roles of leadership. And it took me about 15 of those years to realize that I wanted to get back to my art and do that for a living someday. And then another decade of hard work and dedication to what equates to a second full-time job before I could realize my dream and get to where I am now, a full-time professional artist who's still striving to learn more every day. But I didn't do it alone, and that's why I'm here talking to you today. Without the benefit of years of watching and learning from other artists online, I wouldn't be half the artist I am today. In fact, it was a YouTube video from an artist named Jeff Miracola that gave me the confidence and inspiration to take out my brushes and attempt my very first large-scale painting way back in 2014. So after all those hours spent transporting myself into other artist studios through the magic of the interwebs, I decided it was time to give something back and maybe inspire some others. Now, I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't scary or intimidating to make a video like this. It definitely is. And I can't even count the number of retakes I've had to do of this voiceover just to get it right. But it's also fun and motivating as hell. Very few people have seen my paintings in process, and now potentially the whole world can, if they subscribe. So, by the way, please subscribe, like, and comment. It would really help the channel grow. Okay, enough of the why. Let's get down to business and talk about the four basic steps I used to create this painting of old Batsy here. So, the first step in the painting process that I typically use is what you're watching now. It's the first layer of paint, and not surprisingly, it's called the underpainting. There was definitely a time when that first brush stroke would really scare me, until I wrapped my mind around the concept that this is the least stressful stage of a painting. And if you think about it, there's nothing really on the line yet, just a small amount of time to transfer the sketch to the board. If I make a mistake, I can always wipe it away because I'm working in oils and the paint is still wet. So I just try to keep things loose in this stage. I'm trying to get rid of the white of the board, build some tone and texture, and just feel out where I'm going with the painting process. During this stage, I'll often discover parts of the painting that might give me trouble later, and it lets me know that I probably need to get some stronger reference for those areas. I also try to keep in mind that it's going to look a little messy, and that's okay. I don't want to overdo at this stage because it's all getting painted over, so I just get in there, let the brush fly, create that safety net for everything that comes later. Now, I don't always start with this complex of an underpainting, but the majority of my large paintings do, simply because breaking it down this way into smaller, successful steps can help tackle something quite complex more easily. Typically, artists do their underpaintings in a neutral color, so in the past I've used burnt sienna, burnt umber, and even a desaturated purple for this. But what you're seeing me use here is a chromatic black that's created from a simple mix of alizarin crimson and Windsor green. This is actually a technique that I learned from David Palumbo, a phenomenal artist whose work you should absolutely check out. This mix of color creates a nice neutral that is both dark and yet still has chromatic nuance to it, so it doesn't suck the life out of my subsequent layers of color. I've been using it almost exclusively in place of ivory black on my palette for about a year now, and haven't looked back since. Sorry ivory black, I know it's lonely at the back of the drawer. And so here we have the completed underpainting. I let this dry overnight, and then I'm ready for the second step. In this next step, I'm simply going to scrub in some basic local colors. For this, I'll use transparent paints such as alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, and others that you see here. You can find different transparent paints from different paint manufacturers, but these are simply some of the ones I use often. And as the name implies, these are paints that you can see through, especially when used with a little solvent like Gamsol. And since I've mentioned Gamsol, which is an odorless mineral spirit, now is probably a good time to say that I haven't used any painting mediums at this point, just paint, thin down with Gamsol. Also, a lot of paints that may not be officially considered transparent can be thinned down enough to be used in this stage, but most of all, try to stay away from white. There's really no need for it yet, and if I need to lighten an area because I've put down too much paint, I can simply use a rag with some Gamsol to wipe it away. I'm also using a thicker brush here that can stand up to a little more pressure, since I'm literally scrubbing the surface of the painting to eliminate all those white areas and get a nice undertone for the next step. Usually I'll do this stage before lunch or dinner, and then get right back to the next step in an hour or so. It doesn't need to fully dry overnight, but I like to let the paint set for a little bit before going into step three. 
Step three is really the first opaque layer of paint. But because I've done so much of the foundation in steps one and two, I already know where everything needs to go. And now I just have to go in area by area and make it happen. As far as the strategy for tackling step three, some artists will work back to front, others front to back. For me, it really depends upon the piece. Typically, I like to start with something interesting, challenging, uh, near the focal point of the painting. For instance, on this one, it's Batman's face. The main reason for that simply relates to energy. Just like anyone else, I can lose steam after so many hours in front of my easel staring at the same painting. So I like to make sure that I'm hitting those critical areas when my energy is highest on the piece. I don't want to burn through my energy working on something that's meant to fade into the background. And I really don't want to spend hours painting a background only to get to the focal point near the end and realize that the painting isn't working how I anticipated. I want to find that out quickly. The concept of failing fast is something that I learned in my time in the software industry, and it definitely applies here as well. So what's my mindset as I'm painting the first opaque layer? Well, it's really just trying to find the largest shapes that will define the form. I'll squint at my reference or even run it through a couple of filters in Photoshop in order to merge similar colors and simplify things into larger blocks of shape and value. That's what I want to be painting first and foremost, not all the little details. And this is something that took me a while to wrap my head around, so don't worry if it takes some time to get used to. These large shapes will do all the heavy lifting when it comes to conveying the dimensions of the form and readability of the painting at a distance. I also try to keep the paint relatively thin here. I want it to be mostly opaque, but not thick. If the paint is too thick, that's just gonna make my life harder when I go back in later and try to add subsequent layers. And that's the formula for step three. I go in area by area, painting the largest shapes first before coming back to refine them. Step four is really just an extension of step three. It's where I go back into those large forms I've created and refine some of the lightest lights and darkest darks. This can be done area by area, as you see me doing here with the face, or it can be done all at once in the end. But in reality, I'll be doing a little as I go and a lot more later as things become apparent to me. Because the more of the painting that I finish, the more I realize the areas where I want to put in some reflected light or tweak the contrast to make the focal point pop. Essentially, in this step, I'm putting the sprinkles on the cupcake or the sizzle on the steak. I establish the structure of each area in step three, and now I'm bringing it home with the right amount of detail. And that's something that I'm always asking myself. Is this the right amount of detail for this area? Because if I make every area of the painting pop, then nothing will pop. This is definitely something that I've been guilty of in the past because it's really easy to do. I'm standing there two feet from the painting, staring directly at a tree in the background, and I'm not leaving that spot until that tree looks like the best tree I've ever seen. But the problem is that tree's in the background and it's meant to stay there. It shouldn't be fighting for dominance with my main subject, so I always try to remember to step back from the painting occasionally to reset my perspective and stay away from that trap. And those are the four steps I used to create this painting. Now, there's a whole lot more that went into this before we even took out a brush, but that's definitely a topic for a future video. For now, I want to get back to the topic I promised earlier, which is the inspiration for this piece, and another confession I have to make. The truth is that although I was into comics, I never collected much Batman as a kid. Fine, go ahead, take my nerd card away. I had a few comics here and there like Batman 497 with the epic cover that has Bane breaking Batman over his knee, and of course, Death in the Family where the fans voted to kill off Jason Todd at the hands of the Joker. Savage. But I mostly collected Marvel because that's where my favorite artists were. Guys like Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, and Mark Silvestri. Guys who really inspired me to pick up a pencil every day after school, and during school as well most of the time. Of course, Jim Lee went on to revolutionize Batman and DC Comics as a whole later on, but I was quite a bit older by then. So really, most of my early journey with Batman was on the screen. First with Michael Keaton in 1989, and then it truly took off with Batman the Animated Series in the 90s. I loved everything about that show, and still do. From the art style, to the brilliant writing, to the phenomenal voice acting. Seriously, I lost my mind when I realized that Mark Hamill was the voice of the Joker. That show was groundbreaking. And I think that's where my love for the character, and especially his villains, truly bloomed. Which is why I say that this painting has been 30 years in the making. Well, I definitely had fun creating it, and hopefully you've enjoyed this behind the scenes look at my painting process. I hope it inspires you to take out your brushes or pencils and create something that makes you smile or reminds you of why you wanted to create art in the first place. Let me know how you got into Batman or what characters inspired you to create art in the comments. Also, please like and subscribe because this is a growing channel and every subscriber really goes a long way to help. See you next time.